UBC, uh, Chad Garcia Romero. So uh, before we get going, uh, just one other note that we are right now celebrating 15 years of Gizwatch, and that's a really uh, great milestone. So a big con congratulations to everybody in the Gizwatch community who's been involved in this, uh, in this impactful project uh, over the years. So now I'd like to turn it over to um, Valeria Betancourt, who's the manager of APC's Communication and Information Policy Program here at APC. Uh, Valeria will be talking to us a little more about this special project and also the significance of this edition. So Valeria, turning it over to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you very much, Valeria. That's fantastic. Um, so uh, now I am pleased to introduce you to Alan Finley, who has been editor of Gizwatch since the first edition. Um, Alan will be hosting a discussion with um, a panel of speakers who have all also contributed to this edition. So Alan, I will let you uh, introduce our speakers and get the discussion going. Thanks, Maya, and um, uh, hello to everyone um, in Ethiopia um, and online. Um, we have uh, five uh, speakers with us this morning or panelists with us. We have Gaia uh, Kandadaya from the Business and Human Resources Center. We have Paula Ricarte from the Tech Technologia de Monterrey from the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, Tierra Comun, and the May 1st Movement. Um, they were collectively wrote the report, and Paula is representing the, the author team there. We have Deepika Yadav from the Digital Trade Alliance, 
Alexandrine Perla de Corbian from Privacy International and Shamila Venturini from Derichas Digitalis. Um, uh, Maya, is Shamila in the room? I noticed other people online, so I presume uh, Shamila is in the room. Let me just have a quick look. I'm not sure. Um, possibly not, but we will try to get her um, to join the call. Okay. Well, Alexandrine, if I may kick off with you. Um, uh, in your report, you, you refer to, you, in terms of the technology, your report breaks down government responses to the pandemic into a typology of responses with examples for each. So for instance, you discuss quarantining, lockdown enforcement, contact tracing, border management, and so on. What from your perspective were the primary problems with the way technology was used to control and monitor the spread of the pandemic? Great, thank, thank you, Alan, and, and thank you, everyone. Uh, hello, everyone in Ethiopia uh, as well. It's great to, to join you this morning. Um, I mean, in response to, to your question, um, Alan, some of the things that we addressed in, in our chapter that we uh, contributed um, are, you know, there are several things that we observe with, with the use of um, technology in response to, to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic that I wanted to share this morning. The first one is that we saw governments introduce a range of measures, um, often relying on untested or poorly tested um, technologies. And while there had been prior examples of pandemics, um, none of them had been to this scale in terms of a global um, pandemic, as, as we saw recently. Um, and in many ways, what we were experiencing were unprecedented uh, circumstances. And so in many ways, when we saw governments and companies pushing for these solutions, um, a lot of them based on the use of data and technology with so much certainty, it didn't make sense with the reality of what we were actually experiencing because we didn't know exactly um, how the virus was uh, working, how it was spreading. We didn't know what would make a difference and at what point um, and to whom. Um, and so, so these are some of the issues that we highlight at the beginning of our chapter in terms of the fact that context matters. Um, and it was really important to be able to identify really what was the problem at a particular point in time. Um, and instead of seeing that, we were really seeing a push uh, for techno solutionism. And this point of timing and, and time is one that we were um, looking at in particular detail, where we saw many of the responses that um, were focused on the use of uh, different technologies failed to consider um, what was necessary uh, at a particular point in time and at different stages of the pandemic. Um, and by the time they were rolled out, even if they were justified, um, they were no longer what was needed, and yet there was a huge focus uh, on them. And so uh, we saw very little or no reflection on what was actually the problem at the different stages. Um, and also the reason why I wanted to mention this is that moving forward, it's really important that any audits or evaluation um, of the different technologies that were deployed um, really take that into account so that the lessons learned or the best practices that we're seeing now become more long-term policy issues um, are not based on this flawed um, assessment of, of what was going on. Um, the second point I wanted to, to share is that we really saw a broad, you know, a lack of a human rights due diligence um, and effective enforcement of existing human rights obligation and responsibilities. And that really led to very short-sighted decision-making with little consideration of, as I was mentioning, what was needed for a, an effective public health response. Um, you know, thinking about differential exposure uh, that was coming from a scientific background or differential uh, vulnerability and resilience um, of individuals um, being impacted. And so what some of the one size fit all approaches or replicating or duplicating um, some of these technolo technological measures didn't make sense um, in some context. I think the really important one, and I think that comes through from a lot of the chapters and are part of this edition, is really a limited understanding of the impact on individuals and communities, and particularly those that prior to the pandemic were already in a vulnerable, precarious um, position. Um, you know, we saw a variety of communities disproportionately disadvantaged um, be it women, migrant and refugee communities, LBGTIQ, people already from economically disadvantaged backgrounds, um, 
who were pushed um, into very difficult situations with um, lockdowns, um, impact on job security, uh, for example. And I would say that the last point I wanted to contribute is that it felt when the, the pandemic started that we forgot a lot of the lessons learned that many of us that are here today um, we're already, you know, alerting to in terms of the different dangers that come um, with um, the use of different technologies. We forgot what it meant to use metadata um, and the need to regulate the use of metadata, as we saw, for example, uh, with the use of mobile phone metadata that was used um, to track uh, individuals um, to enforce lockdown measures and quarantine. We saw it with the lack of adequate framework um, to, for data sharing, for example, when it came to cross-border travel, the use of vaccination certificates, um, as well as the limitations um, of technology. So those are some of the points that we saw. Uh, we'd already all documented many of these risks before. And when the pandemic started, as if as we threw out all in the window all of these things that we knew uh, already that could have informed uh, and in, um, improved decision making. Uh, and instead of focusing on those, it's as if we started from scratch. Well, governments and companies started from scratch um, thinking about, oh, what could be some of the risks to some of these issues? Um, so I'll leave it there for now. Oh, thank you. Sorry, there was a problem with my unmute button. Sorry, Alexandrine and everyone else. I was getting frantic and anxious there. Um, Alexandrine, I want to just touch on one thing before I move on to um, another panelist is you, you actually identify three sectors where you feel that pri the private sector has entrenched itself further, um, education, health and employment. Um, can you say a little bit more about this? And particularly, I'm quite interested in whether you think that civil society's concerns with respect to technology, of course, have um, been weakened or, or you feel have been less or now less of a consideration in fields like education and health where they where they have civil society has had quite a, a strong say in the past. I suspect Alexandrine might be having a similar problem to the unmuting. Um, if the, I'm not sure how this is working, but if the host person can allow people to unmute, that would be great. Great, perfect. Thank you uh, to the host. <laughs> Sorry about the delay. Um, so yeah, I mean, for on the on the first part of your question, um, as as you mentioned, we we explored different um, changes in terms of um, how how we are living, how we're engaging in in society as a result of the pandemic, and we um, looked at um, you know the fact that. Um, with the lockdowns and, and different measures, uh, children were having to be homeschooled, um, and so we saw really a push um, for the use of um, ed tech um, in, in many contexts. We also see, so with people working from home, a lot of employers having to shift from an office space to a working from home setup, and some of the measures that they deployed um, as a result. And then broadly within healthcare, the fact, um, you know, these were already things that already underway um, in many ways in terms of the, either the push for telemedicine or for SMS for appointments or just a broader digitization of the healthcare sector. Um, and with the pandemic for various uh, reasons, be it uh, with an attempt to make it more efficient, uh, we saw a huge push um, in that respect as well in the healthcare sector, um, as well as the fact that we were had limited physical interaction uh, but still needing to provide care a lot of um, healthcare facilities shifted again as well to an online um, counseling or online treatment or uh, online appointment uh, mechanisms um, and so 
you know, these are things that we, we and to, you know, connecting it to, to your second, to your second point. Um, I don't necessarily think um, it was around uh, us, like be, us being muted um, as civil society. I think um, us, you know, as you mentioned already, or some organizations were already um, in these spaces. Um, so it was just a matter of how do we, one continue and build our work in those domains, um, especially as decisions were being made very rapidly. And I think that was the biggest um, challenge for, and I'm just speaking on behalf of PI really, um, and some of the comments that came from our partners is, you know, with not being able to be in those spaces, to be in the room where decisions were being made, as it, also because of the context in which we were engaging during the pandemic, it just made it even harder uh, to have a seat at the table. It's something that we, you know, we all challenge, you know, feel very um, frustrated by that often civil society is not included. Um, and I think there was this additional barrier that we saw with the pandemic with not being physically present in a lot of instances, having to join events online, but how do you find out that these events were happening? There was less of that uh, communication happening and enabling environment for civil society uh, to join. Um, at the same time, I think uh, something that we saw um, as well is actually it really confronted us um, for for many of us to realize to connect, you know, um, the more broader digital rights movements or those that are working at the intersection of human rights and technology to be connecting with different allies. And I think um, of some of the, you know, the positive things that we saw in, in the work is that we started to engage more actively with organizations um, working on edtech or organization working on workplace surveillance with unions, uh, for example. And then in the case of health, connecting with organizations that for many years had already been adv advocating for, for the right to health, but slowly being concerned with how technology and data was being used um, in the healthcare sector, particularly in the impact on different communities, be it issues around exclusion or surveillance um, or the, you know, the privatization of the healthcare system. And so I think um, while there are still some ongoing challenges in terms of our ability to engage, I think it also um, in many ways opened up um, some of the opportunities there to connect with, with other sectors and other movements. Thanks, um, Alexandrine. Um, I'd like to go to the room. I believe um, uh, Shamila is from Derichas Digitalis is there. Um, Shamila, um, uh, your, your regional report, um, and I hope you can hear me fine, examines how digital rights advocacy priorities in Latin America specifically have shifted during the, the pandemic. I mean, you identify several new terrains for engagement. What are the, some of these terrains that you identify where that civil society you feel should take note of? Yes, hi.
including social... Shimile, if I can follow up with another question for you, if you don't mind, um, you also speak about you speak about civil society needing to um, be much pro more proactive in um, participating in policy and leg legislative processes, or even approaching the, um, the human rights regional human rights courts and so on. But the one thing you mentioned is strategic litigation, which um, for some uh, internet rights groups this might be a new field of engagement. Um, uh, can you say a bit more about that? Is this something that you see as of growing importance as we move forward with uh, different shifts in power, I guess? Uh the intersection of uh, human rights and technology recently to try to stop and prevent these initiatives pr from advancing. But we um, are aware there, there is a lot to advance on that in terms of strategy, in terms of uh, mobilizing resources, in terms of collaboration. It's very difficult for one sole organization to develop all the strategies needed to advance effective litigation. But we are happy to say there were some very interesting cases and advances in the region region, for instance, to stop and prevent the implementation of facial recognition technologies, for instance, at the public sector. So we believe there is value there. And of course, this is a strategy that always have to be combined with others like campaigning, like training of uh, public authorities, training of judicial uh, um, organizations members, among others. And that's why it's nothing that one unique organization is able to achieve, but it requires a lot of coordination in, in strategizing. I guess we can't hear you, Alan. Could you?
not sure how to fix that. Um, oh, you do now. Okay, great. Uh, Paula, um, you also write about Latin America, but of course it, your report has global implications. Um, what you offer is a detailed analysis of what um, you call public interest technologies. And by that you're referring to contact tracing apps and other technologies used to monitor and control people during the pandemic. Why is this framing of these technologies as public interest, interest technologies a useful framework to use? Hi, do you hear me? Yeah. Oh, perfect. I cannot uh, make my enable my video. Um, thank you. Um, well, thank you very much, Alan, for for your question, and thank you very much for uh, inviting us to speak about our report. Um, I would like to begin saying that in, in the case of Latin America, uh, the technological response of governments to face the health crisis was improvised. So the pandemic highlighted the lack of adequate digital policies, preparedness and infrastructure, and the widespread tendency to adopt opaque private solutions to address the emergency. With no ex-ante analysis, uh, I would say that with no ex post analysis and without proper safeguards. So we um, basically try to, um, to highlight that there is a lack of reflection and a lack of, of, of vision in, in some of our governments in terms of um, deciding why, why do we need technology? And also uh, there's a lack of reflection about uh, the idea of understanding technology as um, as uh, tools for for the public interest. So, by public interest technologies, we mean technologies that have special value because they are deployed to address uh, uh, a specific uh, need of of society in in a specific moment. And um, in this sense, their deployment and use is connected to the public interest. Um, in, this, in this case, uh, in our report, we approach the understanding of public interest technology as involving a set of heterogeneous practices that need to be questioned in relation to the benefits and harms associated with their deployment. In this case, the deployment of um, of uh, current apps, apps uh, for public health, and um, and in 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 this case, uh, with this framework, we are questioning the values uh, which, with technologies and their designs, are aligned, as well as the measures that were taken by our governments to reduce uh, risk and harms, um, or the lack of measures. Uh, to reduce risk and harm. So we believe this, in, this is an important reflection because as citizens, we cannot assume the neutrality of technologies. And these technologies um, are always embedding certain values. And in some cases, these values are not aligned with the advancement of democratic values or are not aligned with um, social justice values. So um, I would say that the public interest technologies framework is um, important for us in Latin America because, as I said, there is a trend associated with a lack of critical understanding of technology as a matter of public interest. So this um, this case in particular, the development deployment of, of current apps um, was a special case to understand that we need to reflect technologies as a matter of public interest. Uh, we need to understand that the technology that we choose, we choose to develop, we choose to buy, uh, reflects the vision of society and as such anticipates our responses to the crisis. And of course, the result, uh, the result of these uh, responses. So uh, our analysis tries to highlight 
these these um, ideas and and these values that are embedded in the decisions of our governments. In this case, developing these current apps. I mean, I found that uh, reading your report, I found it a very useful um, uh, framework, really, because it did break down the different set the different aspects of using technology in quite a systematic way and, and with, with appropriate questions. And I think a lot of people are saying exactly that needs to happen. So, I mean, I would alert people to read your chapter and to, to think about it, using it as a framework. Um, Paolo, you, you do at one point talk about design justice, which includes indicators of performance and liability and reparation, even reparation. Can you say a bit more about this idea of design justice? Oh, yes, yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, the design justice framework, um, it's a very interesting framework because it's oriented toward defining or uh, providing some principles for the designing of an object, a process, or in this case, a technology. And this framework um, that was developed by a group of people, a collective, um, basically uh, reflects on the idea of having the communities that are going to be affected by this design, in this case, by this technological design, to be part of the process from the beginning. So one of the trends that we um, analyzed uh, in the development of these apps is that the public was, was not included at any stage of the process. Uh, until now, we don't know if these technologies were useful. We don't know what, well, we don't know what happened to our data. We don't know what happened to the technologies. We don't know uh, how much money was spent. So we were affected by this technology in some sense because our money, like our uh, public uh, investment, <laughs> we, we um, our money as, as citizens was spent there, but we have no idea, no clue about what happened after these technologies were deployed. We also don't know anything about the contracts. Why were these companies choose uh, to develop or, or um, yeah, to implement those, those technologies? So the design justice framework highlights the idea of having the communities involved in every stage of the process, but also in, in every case that um, uh, it, there is a possibility of harm, there should be included also a policy of reparation. So what does this mean that, for example, if our data, uh, sensitive data, because it was health data that was collected, um, is leaked or if the um, there was no guarantee about uh, the data integrity. Um, what happens? We don't have anything to, um, we don't have many uh, resources to reclaim uh, our rights because we don't know what happened. Uh, we don't have any information about the process. Um, so one of the points of our um, report what one of our um, main conclusions conclusions is that we need to consider not only the, the the problem of privacy because privacy is one of the dimensions we need to consider the complete life cycle of of technological development because in the complete life life cycle we can see that many uh, rights are also um, in danger of being violated by our governments. And we are not, um, and, and we are even not aware of, of that uh, possibility because we don't know, we don't have any information about that. So the design justice framework is a very useful, useful framework to, to understand that the whole process needs to be a social process, not only a top-down decision uh, that has an effect on society. Thank you, Paula. Um, um, Gaia, 
Um, you, you in your report was a very inter interesting report you wrote about public-private partnerships, which uh, most of the speakers have implicitly or directly been referring to. Um, you talk about these partnerships being set up, of course, to implement technology, and how this um, the result is that they've lost significant public trust, um, given the the rights violations that occurred as a result of them. Um, can you elaborate a bit on this, and how do you think public public trust has been eroded um, through the formation of these public private partnerships during the pandemic? Thank you, Alan, and congrats to to APC and congrats to all the authors. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um, as was pointed out by all of the speakers before me, we know that internet and digital technologies played a central role in our lives during the pandemic. Um, when I say that, I mean to those people who had access or were forced to get access during that period. We clearly saw a surge in public-private partnership, as was referred to uh, directly or indirectly, as you said, um, between governments and ICT companies, because states were sort of in a desperate situation to deal with an impossible situation. And on the other hand, we had tech and private uh, sector companies, technologists essentially, who were brimming with ideas. Um, so it, it really was a match in that sense. In practice, uh, PPPs or private public partnerships uh, offering digital based solutions and support during this period included the development and deplo deployment of contact tracing apps, vaccine enrollment and management platforms, health information dissemination partnerships. Um, that's another key area that doesn't often get attention. Um, well, there can be little doubt that many of these partnerships did make our lives a little bit easier. There were lots of concerns. Um, these centered around privacy, data protection, security measures, uh, that govern these digital platforms really, uh, particularly for those of us who engaged with this, uh, with these collaborations, thinking that our data will be withheld securely from third parties. These concerns became sort of even more augmented by the fact that we witnessed large scale spread of deliberate misinformation as an example on social media platforms and messaging applications. Our coordinated campaigns were carried out on these platforms to push harmful narratives targeting racial and minority communities for spreading the virus, for example. Um, we particularly saw this in the case of Bangladesh and India, for instance, and of course, in many other Western countries as well. While platforms stated that they were putting in place policy measures, they were trying to take down harmful content or harmful fake news as they were calling it, uh, about the virus or the vaccines, the implementation really varied based on the context. Enshrining platforms and technology-driven solutions, in a sense, at the center of the response we had to the pandemic, pretty much ceded authority to define the values that were at stake. And it deepened further the pre-existing patterns of inequality, violence, and oppression that existed in society. The fact is, we did not know what is being collected, how it was being used, who had access to it, what happens if there was a violation, is there going to be oversight? Are there going to be consequences? Is there a mitigation strategy in place? We didn't know any of that. Um, in my opinion, I don't think we still know the answer to many of those questions. And you do talk uh, in your piece uh, about, again, this is something that, that we've been, civil society has been pushing for for a long time, is use businesses using the UN guiding principles and business yeah. and, hum, and business and human rights. Um, I do want to throw a bit of a curveball question, and it has been suggested a little bit. I mean, people are talking, the panelists here are talking about a more systematized approach, whether it's a public interest technology framing um, or whatever the framing is, as long as it's sort of these impact assessments um, um, are done when the use of technology, when governments use technology. Mm. And um, what if the governments say, well, it's an emergency and there's just not enough time? How would civil society respond to that? Okay, I think to get to what is what is going to be our guiding value, we kind of also have to take an assessment, as, as my colleagues have pointed out already, about where was civil society's voice and all of that. I think the most significant challenge around this situation is the fact that we are living through an age of digital authoritarianism. On the one hand, 
a significant population of the globe is governed by authoritarian regimes with whom it is dangerous to engage on the one hand. And then we are dealing with tech companies that enjoy a level of opacity and relief from scrutiny, scrutiny unlike other in industries. Um, it is because of this that we have to figure out a way to get our voices heard, right? And information pertaining to these public-private partnerships and the processes governing them is often hard to find because typically these contracts that uh, companies have with governments or governments have with, with companies ha come with a lot of exclusivity. But even prior to the pandemic, civil society groups and digital rights defenders have had to grapple with this whole black box phenomenon where public knowledge about the way in which technologies, technologists or tech-based companies function have always acted as a barrier for us to mitigate or address human rights violations. And, and the fact is the state company nexus is, is there, it often lacks the clarity, especially around what are the terms, what is the money involved, what is really the engagement pattern. And, and, and then we can pretty much forget what happens in regimes where we already don't have data protection um, mechanisms in place. PPPs with tech-based companies are pretty much fast evolving into an opaque bilateral relationship in a sense. This relationship is between two powerful actors. That is one of mutual benefit. And I would even say there's a little bit of fear factor involved in it. And, and why I feel that is because um, what I would, I, I'd rather let me put it this way. What is really interesting about the tech sector being involved in that is the fact that the tech sector is uniquely positioned to shape or influence opinions or even manipulate them in relation to the government, as we saw in the case of Cambridge Analytica, in the case of Brexit. And states, especially in the global south, have license agreement regimes where they can pretty much shut down a company or prevent them from being operated in, in a particular jurisdiction. That means that these two entities are dependent, enrich each other, but are also fearful of each other. But in this equation, civil society gets left out when we bring a very important perspective. And this perspective is really important because on the one hand, you're dealing with states that are fixated on control. And then on the other, you're, you're dealing with companies that are fixated on optimization and profit uh, making to the last minute. So that brings us to the question of how, what should be our guide, right? The sense. And there are, of course, multiple answers to that. Uh, but what I think in terms of what's useful and, and, and the amount of work that's already gone into it is simply the fact that the primary responsibility for protecting our rights remains with states. Irrespective of the kinds of contracts that states may have with companies, they cannot outsource the responsibility to protect our rights. Companies have the responsibility to respect our rights. No doubt about that. Um, I think adequate and predictable accountability mechanisms need to be in place and they need there needs to be regulation and policy especially in areas relating to data protection intermediary liability these are two important things but i think one of the key questions to be answered is what and who are the companies that states should be getting into contracts with because it's unavoidable that that uh, you know states are going to have contracts with companies but I think the main guide there would be human rights and environmental due diligence. And we are seeing regulation policy around it coming up. Um, states, states need to do their own due diligence about which companies they want to engage with, but they need to really require tech companies to do due diligence about how they operate, but also undertake impact assessment periodically. And that, that means that there needs to be stakeholder engagement, as my colleague was pointing out, at different stages, and I mean, across different stages. In my opinion, I feel that the UNGPs are actually a fantastic guide because it's years of negotiations that have gone into it. And there's a significant buy-in even by the business community to the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. I think the UNGPs cover a range of areas, including the state business nexus. This includes financial and other kinds of support provided by states to companies. Um, the privatization of services that may impact human rights, enjoyment or, or public procurement, irrespective, like I was saying, irrespective of the kind of contracts they have, they need to make sure that there's oversight mechanism. And where states financially support these contracts, especially, they need to be actively involved to make sure that there is civil society engagement and that companies 
do not violate rights on the ensure that companies the way they operate respects rights i think overall we need to and to echo what my colleagues have already said i think we need to forge alliances between movements build greater relationships with tech workers tech worker unions that's really the only way to challenge the unchecked power of technologists and the influence um, that they have but i think i think beyond tech specific regulation or tech specific engagement i think there is also this is also perhaps a moment for us to take stock of the need to influence corporate accountability policies in a much more broader sense by bringing digital perspectives to it which i think is definitely a gap currently i mean that's an interesting point about looking where your alliances are for example with tech workers instead of with the tech organizations in, in some sense um th thanks guy Deepika, the, you, you're the last panelist, so I'd like to give you a chance to speak here. It's slightly shifting attention to the question of intellectual property. I mean, your, for, your report focuses on IP during the pandemic and how this affected global and equitable access to vac vaccines in particular, and really touches on the geopolitics and how this is embroiled with business interests, which Gaia, amongst others, have been talking about. Can you briefly explain for pe to people what happened with the TRIPS waiver? Uh, yes, thank you for your question, Alan. Very happy to be here. Uh, hello to everyone and congratulations to all the authors on the report. Um, it was a, um, um, I have to start with how it began and we all know it began in 2019. That's when COVID was discovered. And then uh, come 2020 March and WHO announces that uh, COVID is a pandemic. And then suddenly, you know, we are seeing shortages of PP kits, N95 masks, and then their medicines and people are hoarding. And then, of course, we also see another thing. We see that, you know, pharma, big pharma companies and governments are scrambling together and they're saying that we are going to develop, med uh, we are going to develop vaccines. And we see vaccine development taking place at, at a breakneck, at a speed which has never been seen before. And suddenly, you know, everyone was like, okay, Let's wait for a few months and the entire world will be vaccinated. And countries, countries in global north are making promises that they are developing a public global good which will be available to everyone. And like I said in my uh, report that uh, this is a narrative of broken, uh, of broken promises. So what eventually followed was something that can be captured in the term vaccine apartheid. Uh, we saw that, you know, in Global North, there were people who were getting their booster shots. And then in Global South, there were people who had not even gotten their first shot, right? And then what ensued, what followed this was uh, something that we hope to never see again. You know, there were, uh, during the second wave, there were extreme shortages of medicines. And during this entire time, the developing countries kept on saying that, you know, IPs are barriers and we need to have access to know-how and tech transfer so that countries like India, Bangladesh, Egypt, they could, you know, rely on their manufacturing capacities to scale up production and uh, increase supply for everyone. Uh, we also had come, uh, we also had businesses, pharma companies saying that IP was not a barrier. So this is where um, in, uh, on 2nd October, 2020, India and uh, South Africa together introduced something called TRIPS waiver at WTO. So the idea behind this TRIPS waiver was that, you know, to remove barriers, IP related, IP related barriers. And the IP here included patent, copyrights, trade secrets, uh, know-how, data, to, for all the vaccines, uh, medical products, medicines, so that uh, for a certain period of time till everyone develops immunity. Now, it was a very welcome move from, from, from Global South, and uh, but let's move to the other side on the Global now, which was not appreciated. We saw reactions from EU, we, re we saw reactions from UK, we saw reactions from US initially, which they were, we said that no, the existing trips flexibility are enough, but we were enough, we had enough time to experience that these flexibilities were actually not enough to overcome these barriers and we needed immediate attention. So what happened 
going forward is uh, I would like to also talk about the advocacy around TRIPS waiver. What we saw is that civil services organizations across the globe came together and they drove a campaign where they reached out to heads of states, heads of, heads, heads of state in US, in Europe, to allow for the waiver to pass through. Now, there was a moment in this journey where something happened which was very unprecedented, where US jumped on board and said that they will support the waiver, but only for the vaccines. It was disappointing, but it was a big, big success for, for the civil service organizations because this would not have been possible without their effort. Now, this is, this is also a turning point. It's a turning point because here, US could have played a very important role in pushing this forward. However, US only made a statement. They did not, they did not go ahead they did not go ahead with the promoting their agenda. They did not go ahead in bringing everyone on the table to uh, agree on everything, right? So what we ex what we got is an alternate an alternate uh, proposal from EU, which was a very 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 watered down version of uh, trips waiver and something which focused on compulsory licensing. So it's like old wine in a new bottle. It was something that is already there, which we have experienced that does not work. Now, over the next course, next uh, few, uh, next almost a year of debates and uh, lobbying, uh, we, we saw that, what we saw is that while civil service organizations were pushing for uh, countries to support this waiver in Global North, we, what we also saw was a very focused lobbying by businesses, by pharmaceutical companies who were pushing for the waiver to not get through. And um, in a very recent uh, investigative, uh, an, an investigative uh, article, it has been revealed that how um, the big pharma companies actually reached out to uh, governments, uh, making their point uh, in a certain way that uh, why trips waiver should not be allowed. And it definitely, definitely had an impact on what eventually passed at the WTO ministerial. What we got was something which is a very, which is, if I may call it, a poor cousin of the original TRIPS waiver. It only included vaccines. It allows, it permits export to an extent, and it's only for, uh, I'm so sorry, uh, it's only for a certain amount of time, and it's only for limited products, that is vaccines. Um, overall, uh, the positives are, uh, it was achieved because, had, had the had the advocacy not been there, nothing would have been achieved. But uh, it also makes us realize that Global North will put their business interests first, even at times when even at times when we are faced with unprecedented health crisis. And Alan, I mm. hope that answers your question. No, that does that does, Deepika. I, I do have a follow up question, and then yeah, um, sure. we do need to start sort of closing this session is so that was about vaccines now in, right. in the field that civil society works in we the digital rights ad advocates work in um uh open source software open knowledge open data even the right to repair movement is a new field of ip um, advocacy what are the implications do you think for what happened with the trips waiver with the future for open knowledge advocacy, broadly speaking, for civil society? So, um, thank you for the question. Um, in context, if I look at TRIPS waiver advocacy and I look at advocacy around open knowledge, if you are asking my answer that can the same advocacy work for open knowledge, it will be hard. It's, it will be hard. I mean, if we contrast the situation, look at the situation. I mean, COVID was a grave situation, and yet here we are. I'm not saying that open knowledge issues are not grave. They are grave, but they're not health and time sensitive how COVID was. So same kind of advocacy model cannot fit in here. There are also certain issues within the open knowledge, open knowledge uh, advocacy framework which need to be identified. And what I personally, what that, that is my take, what I personally feel what can work here is that there needs to be a collective effort from Global North and Global South. And we've seen that these collective efforts can take years and years. There is a moratorium on, eco, uh, on 
e-commerce, uh, and it's been to, it's been more than twenty decades, and still there's a moratorium. I think that in itself is an example that how difficult it is to come on board and meet. So, going forward, if we need an advocacy effort, we do need. We have issues, right? We have, especially like when it comes to big data. We know that there's going to be a huge amount of lobbying from big tech companies. So we need a strategy. We need a strategy, but we need a strategy which is realistic, which is consistent. We have to also understand that uh, there will be times when it'll be, will be things will be very quiet, but there will also be times when we'll have to push back. So we have to maintain that consistency. We also have to bring build alliances, and we have to look for. Voice, we should we have to look for people in the corporate who will listen to us and who will send our message across. Thank you, thank you, Deepika. Um, thank you. Um, Maya, the, the, are there any questions? I mean, I think we've got a, one or two minutes to take one or two questions to our panelists. If anyone does have one, I'm not entirely sure where to check or if there's someone in the room who wants to ask a question um, before we hand over to yourself and chat. Not seeing anything in the chat, Alan. Um, if there is maybe one quick question from the room, I'm sorry we don't have more time, but if uh, if there is anyone in the room that has a question, please go ahead. Hello. Um, oh, Go ahead. Sorry. Um, yeah, thank you. I just wanted to thank uh, APC for the opportunity of contributing to the APC Watch. I just wanted to add that um, I made a contribution uh, for Costa Rica, and it's called um, Robotics and AI and the Future of Work in Costa Rica. And I just um, tried to show uh, the deficiencies that we have as a country in terms of policies and laws, um, some action steps that I think that are important to um, make in the country, for example, an uh, AI, a principle-based um, strategy and a risk-based um, regulation using as a model Brazil, um, that it could be a good option for my country. Also, um, like multi-stakeholder meetings, uh, public and private private alliances and also um, trying to, I, I think the role of civil society in my country could be trying to advocate for uh, a law of non-discrimination to avoid biases of AI-driven technologies as well as trying to enforce the recently approved um, law of access to public information and also trying to strengthen the um, data Protection Agency, which um, in 2020 and 2021 did not answer um, the majority of complaints that were presented by citizens in Costa Rica. So thank you, um, APC, for this uh, initiative. And yeah, this was my comment. Thank you. Thank you. That was uh, Yari Ka, I believe. Uh, the, hi, Yari. Thanks for that intervention. Um, as as uh, Maya suggested, I'm very you know we are quite sorry about the time issue here, um, but I'd like to thank I'd like to thank all the panelists who joined us today: um, Deepika, uh, Deepika, Jamila, Paula, Alexandra, Alex, and Gaia. Um, it's been really great talking to you, um, Maya. Back to you. Thank you so much, Alan, and thank you to our amazing panelists. Um, I will now turn it over to chat to make some closing remarks for us. Uh, chat, go ahead, please. Thank you, Maya, and thank you, Alan, and as well as our um, panelists. So I think the first thing I wanna to say to everybody is please read the edition. You've only heard a small part of it. And there's a lot of gems in that. And there's also a lot of, I think, uh, lessons and, and, and points of reflection for us, which was pointed out by, um, by, by our panelists. Um, when, we, when we decided this theme, it is also for, because we wanted, we knew we had to learn. We knew we needed lessons and we knew that we needed something. We actually need a, a different lens, a different bit, you know, to, to, to move forward. And, uh, I think one of the things that struck me in this conversation is that 
a, a common a commonality about the vision of technology um, and the call for public interest technology. And I think a vision and a framework is really helpful in helping us think about strategy and how we move forward, in helping us to prioritize. Um, and in also looking at what we have. Um, I think someone did say that we have, we actually have learned a lot. We have, um, if you look at one of the um, in articles in the in the edition is about internet, internet governance of the future. And that lines up the history that we've had, the kinds of um, agreements that are there that we can use and frameworks that we can use. Um, so I do think that it's important to look at. Um, I also think uh, one of the other things that have come that uh, that comes clearly is the is the focus on what needs to happen between the public and, part and private sector and how we need to have alliances to be able to make a difference. And I do think that's something that we can we can really move forward. If and I, I hope that this is the hope of ISWATCH is to, to actually create those alliances and not only to, to document them, but actually to, to, to use it so that we can it can strengthen our advocacies. I think the last thing I want to make is that in the in the country reports, you really find that the, um, the, the, the context and how much that it uh, it really outlines how different the, the impacts, the uh, differential impacts on the most marginalized um, communities. And I really do invite you to um, to read. There is a, it, there's a lot there. And um, APC will be hopefully using, organizing more um, events, activities, so that we can um, really use this, uh, what we have produced collectively in the last couple of years. It's taken that long, as long as the pandemic. Um, so thank you, everybody, for um, your participation. And we hope to see you at future um, events that are connected with that research. Thank you, Maria. Thank you so much, Chat. And on that note, just uh, to let everybody know that at the APC booth tomorrow, that's Wednesday at 3 p.m., you are welcome to come and join Valeria to discuss uh, this latest report. We especially encourage authors who are attending in person. Um, we would love to connect with you there. So please do come to the APC booth um, tomorrow at 3 p.m. on Wednesday. Uh, thank you, Chat, for those great words. I really um, appreciate this concept of alliances that you're bringing up, and I think that's definitely a strength for Gizwatch and a lovely note for us to wrap up on. Um, people who are there in person, you're welcome to connect with Valeria, who's there on site, if you have any further questions. Um, for all the rest of us, the edition is now live online. You can go to gizwatch.org to download a copy, and we hope you enjoy it. And once again, a big congratulations to everybody for making this huge project possible. Thank you to our panelists, Alan, Chat, Valeria, everybody, and take care, everybody. Just a final note to announce that the Gizwatch full edition is already online, so if you go to the website, you will have access to all the thematic and country chapters. And thank you so much for coming and joining us for the launching of the Gizwatch.